Christopher says, hi, Richard. Rosalind says, hi, Richard Ray. Everyone is saying hello, hello. to each other. Hello, everybody. Kisses to everybody. Rita says, kisses, are you all ready? We're going to do a great job. I'm going to turn off, or let's have everybody turn off their cameras. Don says, bye-bye. Yeah, go ahead and turn your camera on. I'm going to reboot, so go ahead and turn your cameras off. <coughs> go ahead, everybody, turn your cameras off. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to leave my camera off, but everybody else turn theirs on. Or excuse me, I'm going to turn mine, leave mine on. Everybody else turn oh. theirs off, please. Rosalind says, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to start recording. Ready? One, two, three, four. Taking a deep breath. Hi everyone and welcome here to our webinar. Good morning, good morning. Before I begin, I'd like to establish our ground rules before we begin our webinar with our panelists. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your participation here today. Secondly, for those who have already registered for this Zoom, you will also have an opportunity to have a QA session here. Um, and you'll see the QA at the bottom of the screen. You can raise your hand, um, either one. If you'd like to see the captioning, you can press the captioning live transcript button. Um, if you have a question, you can sign it or type it. We will have a deaf interpreter or those who are hearing and don't know sign language, you can speak your, you, you can state your question. We have ASL interpreters. We also have chat. But understand, please respect everyone on the panel and there will be no chatting uh, and we'll, we want to respect the platform. Um, so you can please be respectful to them. Please don't talk while we're having the panelists. There will be no tolerance for bullying or ins insulting anyone you will be removed from the webinar. Lastly, if you have not registered, you still have an opportunity to watch on our live stream on Facebook and on YouTube. You can have this, you can look for the subscribe button on YouTube and there will be a live feed there. You can look at on our website um, we will not have, you will, if you're on the Facebook feed, you will not have an opportunity to do um, the QA live, Q&A live, but you can write comments on the Facebook page. If you have any questions, please remember to raise your hand. 
there will be about a 10 second delay and then uh, for us to spotlight the person and then you can sign your question, uh, give us an opportunity to spotlight the person making the, the request for the question and Ming Chen will be responsible for the spotlighting of the person. And that way you can sign your question. You are welcome to do that when the Q&A portion of our event happens. My name is Kavita Papali. I'm the president. And I like to, I would, I sub, have supported this for a long time. The panelists here are my collaborators with the Deaf Queer Resource Center, DQRC, Drago, and I have worked together for a long time collaborating on this. We're wanting to bring in everyone together and learn from each other. My favorite quote is unity is our strength. Our teamwork, our collaboration will, call, will be successful. That is one of my favorite quotes written by Maddie Stefanik. He became an advocate. I really, really believe in that unity, the strength of unity. So please enjoy our event. Our moderator is Gary Reyes. Come on up, Gary. Hello, everyone. I want to thank all the panelists for being here as well. This is a celebration. And it's an opportunity for us to learn from our own, our deaf LGBT Q and elders of the panel. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jerry Reyes. I'm also the moderator for today's webinar. This is my name sign. My pronouns are him, he, and his. And sir, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Now I'd like to introduce the panelists. I would like each panelist to please identify who they are, tell us a little bit about themselves, and then we'll go into the webinar. So for example, I was born in Georgia. I was raised in Denver, Denver, Colorado in Colorado Springs area. I lived in San Francisco for a while. I also lived in New York in the Rochester area. I've also lived in LA. I currently live in Northern Cal in the Sacramento area. Now let me introduce the panelists. I'm gonna start with Dawn. Don, can you come on up? So Don, if you could come on up, turn your camera on and so you can be introduced. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, everybody. Hi, Jerry. Hello, everyone. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Donald Rosen Kijar, and this is my sign name. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. My parents were deaf. I grew up fully knowing that I was gay. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, sir, as well. <laughs> this is great. Great, great. Um, thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Richard. Richard, could you join us? Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you all. My name is Richard Ray. My pronouns are he, him, his. I grew up in Northern California, Northeast of the Bay Area, in a place in, around Walnut Creek. It's a very conservative area. So when I moved here to Los Angeles in 1981, uh, since then, you know, since I've been gay since 1980, um, since 1983, I came out. Terrific. Thank you. So now our next panelist, Coco, could you join us, please? Hi. Hello. Oops, sorry, let me adjust my camera. My name is Coco. I was born and raised in a beautiful area, island, Hawaii. You know, when I moved to the East, uh, Maryland, was to go to school and to work there. After that, I moved here to Sacramento. I identify myself, uh, my pronouns, are she, hers. I came out as a lesbian during my time at Gallaudet during my junior year. Prior to that, I knew that the word lesbian was not, I didn't really know that because I would be attracted to girls, but the fear and the oppression were, didn't allow me to come out. Now I'm a proud lesbian. I'm excited and looking forward to listening to everybody's stories. Terrific. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Coco. Our next panelist, Rosalind. Excuse me, Rosalind, if you could please join us. Hi, Rosalind. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosalind. Watson, and I am from Louisiana, raised. You know, I've gone to different states, moved there, but recently I graduated from Gallaudet in 2019. Sorry, my, I couldn't remember what year. And then uh, I was there for five years in Washington, D.C., one year in Maryland. I just moved to the West Coast here in California in Hesperia area, California. So I've been here for about five months. Um, you know, I was always attracted to girls, even from being little, you know, and that continued until my mother said, is there, did someone molest you? And I said, no, never. I was born, she said, you must've been born gay. And I said, okay, I'm a proud lesbian. So you can see what my story is all about. <laughs> Great. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Our next panelist is Christopher. Could you please join us, Christopher, and introduce yourself? <gasps> well, here I am. Sorry. I'm still a little awkward with technology, but hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Hello, beautiful people. Thank you, Jerry, Gary. 
Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you so much. My name is Christopher Smith, and this is my sign name. I was born and raised in Chicago, but now I live in California, San Jose. That's where I live now. My pronouns are he, his, them. And I love to say sir too. I'm going to put that in there. Sir, oh, that's a beautiful addition. <laughs> that's terrific. Awesome. I have been queer all my life. And I am proud to be queer. I am, I'm honored to be part of this panel. Thank you. <laughs> bravo, bravo. And I appreciate all of your stories and your introductions. So, as I said, I'm Jerry. I've told you where I was born and a little bit about myself. A little bit more background. I went to an oral school, an, the Evans School. I went to school for the deaf in uh, Colorado. That was a school for the deaf and blind. And again, that was in Colorado Springs. I graduated in 1976, so clearly I'm old. <laughs> um, I've worked several different jobs over the, my lifetime, and I was in the government. I, you know, I worked for, uh, on an Air Force base. I worked in courts, in bankruptcy court. Um, I also worked in the Social Security office and several other places. And now I'm retired. And I retired from the Department of Social Services. I'm completely gay now. Um, there was a time where I wasn't sure. I thought perhaps I might be bisexual. Um, and I can tell you a story about that and the history of that. Um, consider myself bisexual um, I had met a girl, a beautiful girl, uh, and we we both were very much in, we saw each other and we were instantly attracted to each other. We fell in love. Um, we weren't sure how we were gonna communicate though. She was fortunately very aggressive and assertive and she would talk to different people. Uh, and she talked to the executives in terms of jobs. She was worked with managers and all the high level people. And, and she convinced them to pull the resources and buy a TTY, which was very, just a beautiful gesture. Um, and her father was sick and he was in Ohio. Uh, he was also from Hawaii and moved to California and then eventually moved to Colorado. Um, when she was gone though, I ended up decided to embrace my homosexuality and only dated men from then on. I enjoy performing arts and giving mon money to AIDS projects, deaf organization, and so on and so forth. I was um, involved with the Miss Rad 1983. I was a uh, um, facilitator. Um, I didn't win the crown. An individual from London won it. But it was a very good experience for me. Um, I also went to the International AIDS Conferences and worked with uh, individuals there, which was also a very good experience for me. I really appreciate all of the various experiences I've had. And I feel that they have really connected me to the gay community. Sorry. Now I, I'm noticing everything is changing. People are moving and disjointed. COVID has segregated us from one another. Hopefully once the pandemic is under control, we can go back to where we were. 
and eventually meeting new and young individuals. Now that you've seen my story, I'd like the panelists to give us a brief history of their own. And we'll start with Don. Don, would you mind telling us your story? Go ahead, Don. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everyone. My parents, as I said, were deaf. They were involved with LACD. Um, and we would go to, with my, I would go with my parents to the meetings. Um, at around four or five years old, I would, um, one man sat at the bar, sat me on the bar. And, but the man was alone and he was drinking. And my mother said, see that man over there at the bar? He's a, a fairy. At that time, you know, gays were called fairies. He's a fairy. Be careful. My mother warned me. Don't be friends with him. Be careful. And I looked at that man and I felt really bad for him because I knew we were the same. That experience started um, a fear in me that I knew I had to hide who I was. I would go to the movies with my mother and the movie hadn't started. So we were outside of the theater and there were two sailors standing outside in their uniforms. And I looked up at them and I kind of fell in love with them. I was just four years old. You know, that was the world for me. And my mother said, stop staring at them. And I ignored her and I kept looking at them. And my mother said, stop it. And I ignored her again. I knew I was falling in love with him. You know, it wasn't sexual, but it was sort of like a fascination. And so she scurried me into the, um, into the theater. And, you know, I had to hide who I was. So I had a girlfriend in high school as well. I had a high, a high school girlfriend and I went to Gallaudet. I always had girlfriends and the girls who were hearing said, Don is such a good boy. He doesn't molest me. He doesn't try to have his way with me. And now I can't even think about having sex with a woman. I couldn't even think of it then and now. After Gallaudet, I went to Europe. Three months, um, I would meet, for three months, I would meet different types of people, different shapes, uh, different sizes. And I would hear their stories, you know, the, the challenge of their lives, being divorced, being involved with addiction, all these different things that people had gone through. And it really made an impression on me. I, I had been closeted was also a big challenge for me. And at that point, I just, I decided to be honest. And I finally came out to my friends only. After that, after years and years of that, um, I had a boyfriend and we were together for a while. We decided to get married. We had a wedding in a church. This was before it became legal. Then that church allowed our union. And there are a few people that we invited. And my boss said, you're not inv inviting these other hearing people, you know, they work for the church, they need to be invited. And I thought, well, okay, you know, we needed more deaf people. So we didn't want so many hearing people, we wanted an equal amount of hearing and deaf. But we we had a, a bigger wedding. And some deaf people came up to me and they said, I heard you got married. Why didn't you invite me? And so I was, I didn't know how they felt about me being gay. And they said, you know what? We've known that you were gay all your life, all your upbringing. People knew I was gay and I kept it a secret for nothing. So finally I totally came out. I was all out in the open. 
I thought, great, I don't know why I was so afraid all those years. But before there was an ugly history of bullying and taunting and the police raiding these different places where gay people would meet. Now things have changed and I am much happier. I am gay, I'm married now 32 years and that's my story. Terrific, that's awesome, congratulations. And thank you, Don. I appreciate that. I can only imagine how proud you must be to accept yourself and be out as gay. Good for you. Now, if we could hear from Richard and your story. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, I'm just waiting for the spotlight, Gary. Okay. First, I was born deaf. My parents are also deaf. I lived in um, the Columbus area. It wasn't gay or lesbian or anything like that. In that area, it wasn't really acceptable to be gay or lesbian. At that time, I didn't even know what it meant to be gay or lesbian, quite honestly. It wasn't part of my vocabulary. I knew I was different, but how I was different wasn't clear. I liked to wear dresses when I was at home. Uh, I played with dolls. I really wasn't interested in toys that were designed for boys. I wanted to play with things that were typically related to girls. I didn't know why though. And I didn't know that if I was gay, I didn't know that who I was had a name. Because I, honestly, I had no role models at the time. When I went to high school, I realized at that point that I liked men. And, and I think I was in denial because I knew that it was wrong over the years. Well, then I went to college in Los Angeles, uh, which was a blessing, I have to tell you. And during orientation, they talked about various cultures. And one of the topics they talked about um, was sexual orientation. They didn't really call it gay or lesbian at that point. And people who supported the gay community would go to one area and people who were opposed to the gay and LGBT issues would go to another, another side. And you could see how many people were on each side. But because I was in denial, I went to the side that was against or opposed to LGBT issues. At that time, I had a girlfriend as well. Again, I was just all over the place. I was quite confused. Um, and we were together and we planned to get married. I realized that something was wrong with me though. Um, I was having an internal struggle with the idea. So we ended up breaking up. We're still friends today. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow <laughs> I'll be talking with her. Um, we have a wonderful relationship to this day. Another friend of mine came up to me and said, you know that you're gay, right? and told me to stop playing games. That threw me for a loop. I really wasn't ready for that. But I realized it was time for me to stop. I needed to be honest with myself and with other people. And it was, it was painful, I will say. And it's taking me back in this moment, I am sorry. It was an emotional time for me. And through, for several months, I went through this struggle of trying to figure out the emotional parts of it. And then I went home, I wanted to see my grandmother and we sat down and I, I said to her, I need to talk with you. And she said, go ahead, of course. And I said, I'm gay. And my grandma said, it's about time. And I was sh shocked. And she said, I'm here for you. I don't care what your parents think, I'm here for you. I still love you 
and you're always going to be my grandson. All I can say is, wow. I didn't ever think I was going to hear that from my grandmother, whom I loved very much. And then I realized I needed to tell my childhood friends up north. So I, I, sound, I sat down with my closest friend and we're still close to this day as well. We have a great relationship. And I told my friends this, that I was gay. And they were shook. They had no idea I was gay. And they had a sense of betrayal. That's what they felt because I was telling them that. And I told them I've been struggling with this with my own sexual orientation for some time now. I mean, now we're very comfortable and I'm comfortable being out and everything like that with everybody. But the history behind this is because I grew up in Columbus area and the media has painted a horrible picture about members of the gay and lesbian communities. And that frightened me. I thought of myself as criminal we're not, but that's what the media showed me, at, painted this as. And I love Los Angeles because it's so diverse here. We have gay and lesbians, we have trans individuals. Everyone is here. I went to San Francisco. This is after I came out uh, with a boyfriend at that time. And it was, it was a struggle even then he trying to hold hands with him in public, it just, it was still ingrained in me that it was not okay to do that. There was part of me who wanted to and the another part that was telling me don't do it. It was this struggle that continued. Today, in this environment and, and this, you know, what's going on in society, I wonder, I'm living in a world today where everyone's now open they can hold hands. Uh, there's council members who will talk about their husbands or congressmen. And it still shocks me. To this day, it still shocks me. And there's some part of me in the recesses of my mind that I'm still trying to work through all these new experiences and to make myself comfortable. I'm happy to be living in this world and happy to see the transition over my lifetime. It's been terrific. It's been so different. I mean, even on TV shows, oh my God, a man will say, yeah, this is my husband. And it would never have happened back in the day. So that's been my experience. Thank you for letting me share that with you, Jerry. Awesome, awesome. I get how you've been through all of that. Wow, amazing. Uh, yeah, we should be proud gay to be gay. Now, um, our next person who is going to share their history is Rosalind. Please um, spotlight Rosalind. Hello. When I was small, uh, about three years old, four years old, I always was flirting around with all these little girls. My childhood neighbors, I would go to different areas, all these girls I would flirt with. And the girls I would flirt with, the girls would look at me and start walking away to tell my parents about what I was doing that I was flirting with her. And so <laughs> my mother laughed, giggled and said, come on, come here. No, 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 don't flirt with girls, okay? She didn't spank me, scold me, nothing. And she didn't tell my dad. So I understood what, I didn't understand what lesbians were or what they looked like. And then still in the back of my mind, I remember that. I would go to the store, you know, um, after school, I would buy, buy things for my brothers and sisters and me. And um, uh, if they tried to buy me girls clothes, I would have a fit. And I said, no, I don't want to buy those. 
girls' clothes. I don't want to wear them. And she said, all right, you're just going to have your old clothes then. I said, fine, that's, that's fine. You know, I would not have new clothes for school. I would go to my dad and say, mom didn't want to buy me boys' clothes. And my dad said, all right, let's go to the store. Alone with my dad, my mom would be oh, so upset. But all these different things that happened during my childhood, you know, I was daddy's girl. So as time went on, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. You know, I went to a hearing school or that had oralism. It was in, uh, in Louisiana. I was about 11 or 12 years old, um, very, almost 12 years old. I went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, the school for the deaf there. I fell in love with one girl there, I have to tell you. I was 12 years old, imagine. I met that girl and we were girlfriends at 12 years old, imagine, wow. <laughs> and the staff reported it to my mother. Uh, the dorm staff said, I'm gonna tell your mother and I didn't say anything, I knew I might be in trouble. So I would go home on Friday nights and my mom acted like nothing happened. So I was a little bit confused. But then like Saturday night, my mother said, I'm going to drop you off Sunday. Uh, I had already, I had been riding the bus, but my mom said we were going to go. And so they said, we're going to have a meeting. And the staff said, oh, you're going to be punished for one week. And I started crying. You know, I was alone. And my mother said, Pinky, that's my nickname, Pinky. She said, I know you, you love girls. Please don't, you know, go out with girls, go to school. I know you love girls and girls love you. And I just looked at my mother, I said, okay. And then my mother walked away, you know, and I stopped crying and my, I still had my girlfriend until we were seniors. And then at Gallaudet in 1986, I fell in love with another girl. I broke up with that first girl and just went on with the other one. So um, my life has really been uh, a, a, some time of oppression because during high school, I was bullied and insulted about being a lesbian, but I was very popular. I was, I'm funny. I'm very artistic. I was very popular. I am during my senior year of school. They picked me as the most popular in my school. And still to this day, many people who were former students who insulted me and bullied me, they came out as gay and lesbian. One person who was a lesbian in high school said, um, I, you know, I, I know, I know you have a wife. Uh, but I really like to, but to this day, uh, the whole world has been changing. And I thank the people who fought to stay who they are, who I am, who let me stay who I am. And really those people understand the youth that have to hide from their parents um, or were neglected or were kicked out. You know, we needed, we needed them to, we need to educate them. Love yourself first before others. If you love yourself, you're fine. You're fine. Love yourself. People will love you for it too. And that's what I have, you know, that's what I've done. Terrific. That's a very good point. I think you're right. We do need to love ourselves. Now we're gonna learn from Coco. Okay, my turn. Hello. So my coming out story, um, well, I grew up in, in the island as a native. At 10 years old, we moved. Um, like I said, I was in Hawaii and I went to school for the deaf in Hawaii. And, you know, most people just kind of follow the norms of society, right? Girls date boys, boys date girls. When I was getting older, um, there was a girl I had and we kissed, you're kind of teasing, we kissed and my heart was all a flutter. Um, in Hawaii, the, my, everybody knew each other, you know, everybody knew my parents, it was hard to keep anything a secret. And I was scared, of course. Um, 
I was involved with football later on. Um, the various sports like swimming, basketball, volleyball, all of those, but most of mostly football. I loved football. I think I was a teenager. I decided to get dressed up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess you could say dressed like a boy, but more like a tomboy. Um, you know, people had a comb in their back and I was in my back pocket and I was told I couldn't do that. That was for boys. Um, and again, I was following the norms of society and I did girly things that dressed like a girl, but inside it was not who I was. So I was doing that, I baited boys, and I entered Gallaudet um, and ended up leaving. And when I got serious, I went back and I fell in love there uh, with a girl. And there's actually two different professors at Gallaudet. One was a deaf education or deaf history and one was deaf education. And I just, I wanted to date them. I couldn't, of course, but I wanted to. I had a friend and we'd go out and we'd go on dates, things like that. And I got excited. And and that friend said, you know, you're clearly are flirting with women. And at Christmas, Gallaudet was closed, you know, as it typically is. And I went back to Hawaii, uh, went to the beach, which was kind of my Zen area. And I paddled out in, in the ocean. And I was kind of being reflective and trying to see who I was. And I knew I'm a lesbian. I'm attracted to women. So I decided that moment that I was going to come out. I wasn't sure how I was going to come out to my family. The, we had a strong culture, and which um, is influenced by Chinese history, Chinese culture. So I came out with a tank came out to a friend, and my friend was like very supportive. Great. As I was getting closer to senior and getting ready to graduate, I wanted to come out. It was bold. I knew that. Um, I was concerned about it, but I knew I had to do it. I was done being a, oppressed. I had experienced it as a deaf person. Um, you know, using hearing aids, things like that. And I thought, am I going to deal with this and tolerate it as a lesbian? And I thought, no, I'm not doing it. And I knew it was bold, but I was going to come out. So how did I, I did it um, at our time, technology was a little different. So we had TTYs. Remember, everybody remembers, everybody remembers TTYs. So I came out from my mother. She was like, no, no, no. She's very upset. She cried. Of course, my family was strong. They Uh, rallied together and they came at me and asked me what was going on, you know, kind of yelled at me. And unfortunately my family disowned me because of that for a while. I had to figure out, you know, I had to come back to my mom, try to convince her, but my mother refused to come to my graduation because I was a lesbian. I didn't know how I was going to convince her or what I was going to say to her. And most of the people worked um, and only three of them had gone to college. So I convinced my mother to fly to DC and she wasn't happy. And you could just tell in her face, she was not happy about this. A while later, my family got together. My sister was very supportive and she realized that I was happy being who I am, living my truth. Um, And we didn't have a discussion about it. Still to this day, we have a real discussion about it. Um, My mother's older. Um, I figured, what am I gonna tell her? I tried to have her, tried to tell her to be open-minded about things. And at that time, back then, um, there were very stereo- various stereotypes, um, awful labels. Uh, queer was okay, but dyke was not. And that was a word my mother knew. 
Uh, so I tried to remember all those things and I kind of held on to it, you know. Um, um, I have a cousin who's lesbian. I have a niece who's trans. Uh, and I really want to be, I'm thankful to Stonewall, as you all know, they, those individuals fought for, you know, the rights we now enjoy, particularly trans individuals at that time. Um, and it's made it much easier for this generation. You know, now there's voting and uh, there's marriage equality. It's not perfect, of course, but it's changing. It's changed throughout our lifetime. It's made it so we can feel more comfortable with who we are. A sense of relief has overcome all of us. And interesting, I fly to Hawaii. Um, and my mom knew I was a lesbian, but often, you know, if I was going to go, I was like, I'm going to go to a gay bar or whatever. I couldn't tell her I was going to go to a gay bar um, because still those restraints were still inside, right? Inside of me. And I just wouldn't do it if I went anywhere. And if I went to a bar and flirted with girls or girls flirted with me, I would never tell my mom that. Uh, my sister, I could tell. Other people, I could tell. I just could never tell my mother that. And she's getting better about being open-minded, but there's a tradition that she still hangs on to. And, and I don't want to be rude to her about that. I'm trying to show her the respect she deserves. And, and she has been supportive in different ways. Uh, uh, my uncle did disown my cousin cousin because she's a lesbian. So I'd rather have the support of my mother and not be able to discuss certain things that I would be have to be disowned. And she always asks me if I'm okay. She checks in with me. Um, and she never says, you know, I'm not, I'm proud of you or anything like that, because that's just not part of her culture. Uh, and and I, I accept that. And quite honestly, I'm happy. I came out. I don't have to hide anything. I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm free, you know, and I'm sure you all feel the same way. It's just a good feeling of being who we are. And so, again, I just want to say I want to thank Stonewall and for the work they did that has led to our freedoms today. So that's it. Awesome, brava, brava. I am so proud. I'm so proud of you, Coco, to be as fabulously gay as you are today. I know back in the days, parents were not understanding, but things are changing. And now with more people coming out, opening minds, continuing with their love. And now our next panelist is uh, Christopher. Come on up, Christopher. Thank you, Jerry, thank you. Okay, okay. Oh, <laughs> having some technical issues here, hold on a moment, okay. Let's see, how did, how do I start? I'll try to make my story short and sweet, but we'll see. Um, first, I was seven years old. And I remember I was watching an old movie called Stormy Weather. Stormy Weather, um, and that that was the name of the movie that I was watching. And the star of that, um, the star of that movie was Lena Horne. And oh my gosh, it was so old. She, an older, she was an old black woman. Um, but back then she was very young. I was only seven years old. And at that time, you know, my, my, there were no barriers to it, but, um, uh, my whole family was watching it. I was watching the movie. It was about two or three in the morning. All my family was asleep except me. They were all in bed asleep. In that movie, uh, something popped up in the movie. Whereas Lena Horne, the movie star, was singing. 
Oh, stormy weather. And I sat there entranced with her, the way that she was telling the story, the whole movie. I watched it all the way until it was finished. I went into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I opened um, the cabinet and I got my mother's earrings out and I put them on. And then I got my mother's lipstick, her red, red lipstick, very bold red color. And I put it carefully on my lips. And then I started performing like in the movie, like Lena Horn. You could see me just acting the whole, the way she sang, the way she performed. I was seven years old. I had 90% feminine in me, 90% of feminine in me. I could, I could sense it. Lena Horn helped me to accept who I was inside and be proud of who I was to be femme. Even though my fathers, my brothers were big military guys, I tried to fit in with them, but I just couldn't. My feminine side beat out that strong military persona. And I tried to disconnect from that. And I, I tried to be more masculine and it killed me on the inside. I felt such a disconnect, you know, like bricks were inside of me. And so once I let go of that, I embraced my feminine side and I felt beautiful. I felt gorgeous. Even though I was raised with bullying and teasing and they called me sissy and fag, I, I couldn't hide who I was. It was time to reveal myself. You know, it's interesting. As I get older, I've realized I love who I am. And I, you know, that the one man show that I have called Lena and me, because Lena helped me connect and grow and let me be the black, deaf, queer person who I, I am. And it's interesting nowadays, you know, with gay rights, gay marriage, everything has become so positive with this lifestyle. And I feel like the future's promise for the gay world is happening now. So I have no regrets. No, nothing inside of me regrets that. So thank you for watching me and thank you, Jerry. Oh, th that's great. That's great, thank you. That's a very nice story, Christopher. I remember when I was younger, I was probably I don't know, six, seven, maybe eight. Um, I, I saw my mother and she was in the bathroom and she was wearing her bra and that was it. And she was doing her hair and her hair was long. Um, I, maybe, you know, down to her knees. Um, it was, she was gorgeous, gorgeous. I loved her hair, it was so beautiful. And as she was combing her hair, I was sitting there watching her just thinking, you know, God, how beautiful she was. She was doing her makeup, her eyelashes and so on and so forth. And I was just in awe of it. Later, I ended up stealing <laughs> my mother's uh, mascara. <laughs> yes, I took it from her and I went into the mirror myself and tried to apply it. Oh, my eyelashes look so beautiful. They look like my mother's. Uh, and I hid the mascara, I, hang, I hung on to it. And I had forgotten about it, it was in my pocket. And much later, um, I think my mother was collecting clothes and she picked everything up, including the shirt that I was wearing and she found my mascara, her mascara. 
and she asked me about it. Um, and I think at that point she started realizing that her son must have been trying to put on the mascara. I don't, and actually she didn't mention it to me until much later. Um, but she, I was going out with friends or something like that. And my mother told me, hey, uh, she, was, she was using this, um, she was saying things like, don't, she was calling my friends fag. And I was like, don't do that. And then later I explained to my mother, you don't call people fag, mom. It's not nice. We're friends. And people were gay. And she was, and I think she understood it at that point. She started to get a little bit uh, more accepting of it um, and accepting me as her son. But I, I understand, you know, my mother has two gay sons, so uh, she's quite used to it. But um, in the world, the gay community, they're, they're all over. They're an actor, they're actors. I have a picture here. My headshot. Wow. We're involved in film now, as you can see. in theater, uh, for gay and lesbian community productions. And these are things I've been involved with, right? I've done camp shows. And also gay groups that do things annually on Halloween and host parties and things like that. And I've won several awards, our first place for my costumes at Halloween. Um, for this example. Amazing, that's gorgeous. Yeah, Gino, one guy. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Famous with um, Halloween, for his work on Halloween costumes and makeup. He knew that I was pretty talented when it came to putting makeup and putting a costume together. And he congratulated me when I won first place. And also because um, I got the grand first place as well. So it was a big honor for me. And honor, uh, excuse me, Gino was the one who gave me the award. And it was just lovely. And now I'm in involved with modeling. Well, I actually used to be involved with modeling. Um, you can see some of my portfolio here. Now I'm retired. <laughs> um, I do every once in a while, I do some acting on a part-time basis, but the gay community has become different. Um, people are, you know, I, so I stay home. I, I do a lot of quilting, crocheting, mm -hmm. see something I've made, um, done with quilting. I, I do, I work with, um, like a sewing machine to do this kind of quilts. Wow. See? Wow. And I just put these things together. I, like I said, I do crochet as well. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. I that's also do art. Oh my gosh. Wow, that's beautiful. My goodness. So I've kept art in my life, even as I get older. <laughs> as a proud gay man, an older gay man, I just enjoy continuing to do my art. <laughs> Still beautiful, so beautiful. So that's my story. <laughs> so now, I would like to open it up for a Q&A from the audience. So audience members, um, please go ahead and pose any questions you might have. Next. 
Um, Jack, do we have any questions? Hello. Hey, Jack. Okay. So any questions? Yes. We have two questions and I'll start with the first one. Our elders who have had many, many years of experience, we're wondering, have you seen different signs uh, for gay? What was the old sign for gay or what was the signs for butch or femme? What are the different signs you've seen over the years? Yes, Jack. Um, so I remember a long time ago, the sign for gay um, was right here. But I think that's changed as well. I think people start to do this instead now. Um, I think a lot of people, are, because of sensitivity, maybe set this finger spell it. Um, so you'll see, you know, because gay mean happy or whatever. Panelists, are, do you see other signs? Okay, Richard. Yes, I'd like to add, whoops, let me wait for the spotlight. So I'd like to add, but, um, hold on, Richard. Hold on a minute. Let's get you spotlighted. Spotlight, Richard, please. Okay, Richard, go ahead. Back in the day, um, the language I learned for gay was this, pinky on the eyebrow, or before homosexual was like this, like your middle finger from the tongue back to your, the back of your head. That was back then. Now I've seen people sign the G-A-Y for gay or the L on the chin for lesbian. That's what my time. That was the, the sign for lesbian. But we, now I see fingers spelled gay. Okay, Coco, can you respond as well? Sure. Uh, got me? Yes, yes. Okay, and my turn, right? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm glad that person brought it up because gay, G-A-Y, uh, you know, the finger spelled word with ASL rules, you finger spell it because like you have loan signs like C-A-R for car uh, and G-A-Y for gay. But within the group of gay people, you would have that sign. Lesbian has different signs, the, the, the finger on the chin or the whole hand on the chin. It depends on their identity. For me, it, that sign means, oh, I can't spell androgyny, which means, you know, there is a range between the masculine and feminine inside. So... Like gay or lesbian has their different signs. Femme, I've seen fingers spelled. Again, it depends on the individual and their identity. And it's not for everyone. You know, some friends of mine, we've had discussions about it. You know, the sign for black lesbian, you know, they use the whole hand on the chin, you know, and there's nothing to hide. You know, why is it modified? You know, but other people use it on the lips like lipstick lesbian. And that depends on their identity. It's your own identity. And the whole, the sign, you know, like the sign for gay, the G on the chin. Now I've seen more finger spelled G-A-Y. That's my perspective. Oh, nice. Okay. Who's next? Uh, do you want to offer something, Rosalind? Okay, great. Go ahead. Can you spell like Rosalind, please? Okay, so hello, um, Butch and, Butch is kind of old, um, you know, I saw this sign for Butch sometimes, the kind of the, mm -hmm. um, same with Dyke, um, it was like the fist on the chest. So Butch was here, but uh, that typically used for white women. And, 
stud? Stud was used for uh, black lesbians. So I think there's a difference there. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Okay, um, Jack, what's our next question? Hold on a moment. Yes, I have a different, um, an, our next question states, I'm doing a favor for a friend of mine. My question for the panelists, thanks for your beautiful stories. I really have seen your stories and I'm amazed. You know, those people who haven't discovered themselves yet, I, I look at your stories and I hope that my students see watch your stories. How can I, my question is, how can I support them that it's okay to be who and what they are? That it's okay, you know, they can stay who they are, even though maybe they're not really, they don't really know and understand themselves. Because obviously they may not have any role models, anyone to look up to. So it's important for the student, students to go through that experience, but they actually really need a role model. So my question is, how can I support them who haven't really identified themselves? And how can I let them know that it's okay to, for them to be who they are? That's a good question. Uh, why don't we start with Don? I guess you could answer that question. You can start that question off, Don. So my husband, he works in a high school. And sometimes I go to the high school as well. And I notice there's two boys, I remember two boys in high school and they were holding hands. And they're just walking down the, you know, pathway and they kiss. And I, the, the teacher thought nothing of it, was trying to be very supportive of it. I think the high school principal is openly gay as well. So support. I don't know, sometimes if you just leave things and allow people to believe it's natural or see it as natural, there's no issue. If they don't hide it, it's just different, right? Back in the day, that's not how it was. People were afraid, they had to be careful. That fear is gone. Kids feel very comfortable being who they are, saying they love one another, holding each other's hands. It's a very natural expression of their affection for one another. I think sometimes we worry too much it might be easier just to let it be and it will just, that will be the support you can give them. Yes, it depends on their parents' acceptance or well, as well. And if they don't, or if they, uh, you know, if their parents react in a way that will make them run in the closet. Richard, did you want to answer this? Richard says, yes, I will respond with my experience with this. Back in the day, first, you know, as I told you earlier, my upbringing was in a very conservative family. And I, you know, kind of, they, I was estranged from them for many years. I knew that they were against the, the lifestyle, the gay lifestyle. So when I reconnected with my family two years ago, my whole family, my favorite aunt was very excited. She goes, I wanna show you a picture of my son and his boyfriend. And I was taken aback and shocked, first of all. Then my niece, you know, was, is in school now in college and she fought to keep gay and lesbian, the gay and lesbian center at her school in a conservative area. I was, that shocked me even more. So using the information provided on the table for people to look over, you know, in private, and then maybe they would come by and just grab a pamphlet or something, you know, and that was their way of being an open gay and lesbian center in uh, this conservative area, just to have a table with pamphlets or literature in the uh, school where people could just come by and pick up a pamphlet and then take it home to read. Oh, that's great. That's a really great idea. Um, and it helps people recognize the issues out there. 
uh, Coco. Okay, have it been spotlighted? Okay, uh, I just want to make sure. In response to that, in terms of how to support young people, and I think there are books and things like that, um, but also what do they need and what are they asking for? My experience, you know, I've taught K through 12. I think it's often important to provide them with resources that they may want to read. And so we can frame the different experiences. Um, the Deaf Queer Resource Center, for example, might have the information they need and that can lead them to the support they need rather than attempting to oppress or hide it, right? So I think that's a really important thing is to encourage them to find whatever resources they need and to show them where those resources are to get so they get that support. They need to find something that is like a role model, right? Um, and it depends on where they are, where they live. Um, there might be some area, some location they can get the resources they need, um, like the deaf, the queer, a deaf queer resource center. Um, but connecting them with these types of resources is really important because that helps them feel more free. And hopefully that will help and you can begin to see how you might support these students in that way. That really helps, yes, yes. Um, next we have Don. Did you wanna respond, Don? Yes, I did. So one thing I forgot to, to add, I went to several plays where um, my husband was working. Every time there was a play or some sort of theater, there were, there were the gay role models there, you know, you know, they would just come in very openly and say, this is my, this is my husband and introduce, you know, another man. And so that was where there was no oppression, where, uh, and there were a lot of parents in the audience. And the most of the students in that high school were under the poverty level, most of them. Uh, you know, in that area is very, they have a very strong culture, very Hispanic, very Latino. And so there was uh, a lot of people um, who were in there and who were in the, the people who were in the plays they saw in the media, they saw there around the school and the parents saw that and it spread throughout the, the community. That's right. Parents can see the children in their plays and doing things. You're right. It's a very good point. Jack, do we have another question? Yes, uh, did you see Christopher wanted to mention oh. something? Christopher, did you wanna say something? Yes, I, I did wanna add something. Um, are we, am I spotlighted? Okay, perfect. I think it's extremely important to spread awareness especially at schools, in the middle school and high schools, uh, so that, that we can start to tell people that it's not okay to bully members of the LGBTQ communities. Um, that's my advice as well, to spread the awareness and stop the bullying that occurs. Jerry says, yes, that bullying will not be tolerated. That is not uh, anytime, anytime, it's not a, that's not good. We all have love. We all have love and support for each other. Let's do that love sign. Yay. Um, Jack, are there any more questions? There are more, okay, go ahead, Jack. So far, we don't have any hearing people who are asking questions. Uh, so it's great that we have this Q&A chat box. So has anyone attended RAD or the DQMO events, the Rainbow Alliance for the Deaf or Deaf Queer Men Only? This is Jerry, yes. 
Um, I was involved in the past. I was the acting president of the Rainbow Alliance of the Deaf for a short time. And at that time, there were different problems, there were legal issues, legal proceedings that were going on and they ended up closing it. Um, I'm not really sure what's going on with RAD now. Uh, perhaps it will be resurrected, but I'm not really sure. In terms of DQMO, um, I wanted to be involved in that, but I've been so busy with other things that I just never had the opportunity. How about the rest of you? Are you guys all involved in those things? Coco. First, okay. first, I was involved with RID and I noticed um, RID was changing and I was watching it, you know, I was not really, a I was a member, but I wasn't really actively participatory, but I didn't get involved mainly because there were a lot of gay white people involved. It's changed since then. But for me, you know, with me being a lesbian, um, I didn't feel comfortable because they did have some lesbians, but that 90% of them were very white. Now things are changing and things have improved. There's more and more BIPOC people involved. Um, I'm not involved because, you know, I've got a lot of work with COVID, everything kind of changed and my uh, focus changed, you know, and I think it's better, you know, now things are changing. Yeah, we do need those kind of organizations to stay, you know, stay uh, um, running. And so the next generation can get involved with them. Are there any questions related, any other questions or responses to that, Rosalind? Yes, yeah, so the last time I went to the RAD um, event was 1996. I think it was 1996. Nope, nope, nope. Nope, I'm sorry. It was 1999. And that was in Orlando, Florida. Um, that was my first and last time attending the event. I'm a member of RID, but then, you know, as Jerry said, it was disbanded. Um, hopefully it'll be resurrected. And I, I agree with Coco that I went that one time and it was a sea of white people. And there were very few people of color there, very few BIPOC. And I'd like to see there be a more um, equitable representation there and more diversity, but there wasn't at that time. Jerry, uh, yes, um, who's next? Oh, Richard, you wanna make a comment? Hi, uh, with the Rainbow Alliance, I went to their conference. I went twice only over the years. First of all, here in Los Angeles. And then secondly, the last one, I went to Colorado. Those were the only two I went to. I only went to two, two, two times. Um, and then I went to, what's the acronym? Oh, uh, DM, DQMO. You know, I've never been um, participatory with that group. Just the two conferences I went to for Rainbow Alliance. Oh yeah, I was probably busy with work. I have no life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah no life see my sign <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and maybe after the pandemic is over we'll see a difference and mo we can go back to normal and these organizations will be revitalized let's hope let's hope um those of us elders you know we'll we can keep an eye out and you know keep our fingers crossed that these organizations stay afloat Jack, can we get our next question, please? Yes, yes. Let's see, what's our next question? What are some ways that we can connect with deaf queer youth? What are your thoughts about what ways that we can connect with them? Hmm. Uh, any leaders here who 
Can I want to kind of start off with that. I, mean, I guess one thing I may think is ask who the leaders are. I don't quite honestly know. Um, I don't know what people are doing out there. Any of you know? Richard? Great. Well, I'm not necessarily a leader or not necessarily a leader, but I think people who are willing to interact with the community and lift them up and provide support whenever you can. I don't think you have to be a leader to do that because I think everybody can be a leader in different ways, right? Right, right. So, yeah, so I guess it really the just person depends on who that. moves things along, right? Oh, sorry, Richard, that was me. Gary, oh. uh, I was, uh, sorry, Richard, I was interrupting you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love you, Jerry. I love you. No worries. <laughs> all okay. right, all right. Coco, you can go ahead. Um, what Jerry says, the leader, well, I understand that, that there are many leaders, yes. But a designated one person who moves ahead and then everybody gets involved. And each one of them are leaders as a collective. Um, Coco, you wanted to make a comment? Coco says, yes, uh, related to that. You know, really our time with the deaf schools, we didn't have LGBTQ groups or clubs. Uh, nowadays, more and more schools do. Not all of them, but they have some sort of, you know, as they meet people and they come together, you know, and they start uh, having a discussion and related to role models rather than leaders. I don't think they're really leaders. I think they're more like people who find, who are like-minded, who come together and have a, a connection. Especially BIPOC people and API, uh, it's a challenge because within different cultures, you know, with their, I can't speak for everyone, but in my culture, it is a challenge with API, Asian Pacific Islanders. There's such a pride uh, there that again, you have to find someone you trust and that you can feel comfortable having an open discussion with and come out to instead of being oppressed. You know, our experience where we were oppressed for many, many different uh, identities that we have, you know, and looking for support and being able to come out. That's my, that's my part. Oh, thank you, Coco. Don, what would you like to add? And Don is saying, so back in the day, gay people in terms of, they were limited in how they could interact. Um, they, where they went to meet each other was gay bars. These were safe spaces for us. There were no other places we could go to. We had to go to the bar. But today, there are a variety of places you can go. There are churches that have gay groups. There are bowling leagues that have gay groups. Um, and so it's harder for deaf people to join or know which one to join because there's so many that are run by people who are not deaf. And groups that are focused on deaf people is really kind of, they've shrunk over the years. In West Hollywood, they still have one. It's called the Boys Town. Um, it's a deaf group that gets together and on a regular basis, but I think a few people kind of have dropped out. So it's, it's shrunk as well. Times are changing and I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Cause I'm not, I'm just not sure. <laughs> yes. Yes. Back in our past, we would hang out, but nowadays everybody's kind of spread out doing their own thing, especially with COVID. Now things have really changed that there are only a few select people who will get together in a group. I don't know, it's not like before. Um, our next person, Richard, did you wanna say something? Yes, I'd like to add, uh, make, I wanna add something. Um, to what Don mentioned about West Hollywood, the gay, the gay community in that area. Right now, I'm seeing a lot of changes. There's a lot more straight people moving into that community. But a long time ago, we would have a Halloween on the boulevard. Oh my, before, you know, we would all come together 
only for gays and lesbian, the community to come together, to gather. And it became so popular, many people, it didn't matter their orientation, would come in. That was one fourth, one fourth of the population of that city. The rest, three fourths, didn't dress up. So we lost their, our culture there, you know? So I, now I don't go because I'm like, okay, no, thank you. There's too many people who are not dressing up. So we've lost that Halloween dress up culture, but, and then with COVID even worse, I think Don wants to say something. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And actually I wanted to say, I was actually there. I went there religiously. I went to the Halloween parade um, and it, I saw it change over time and more straight, straight people kind of came in and it changed the dynamics. And after that, I saw less and less costumes happening. Um, it wasn't like it was before. And I missed that. I missed the old time where we'd come together in these really fancy outfits and do these things. They were just so much fun. Okay, so now, Don, did you want to say something? Yeah, so some years ago, the National Associates and Deaf Conference in uh, Kansas City, there was a um, one night they had um, a deaf get together in town. We were all sitting around talking and I think it was like $5 to get in at the door. And it was on the same floor. Um, and we had, there was a president of RAD was there and he posted a sign there and the sign said for gay and lesbian community members in Kansas City together, there was a bar that they were gonna go to and it was free to go to that. And deaf people went, they were attended to go to the NAD a meeting and realized or celebration, but it's, that's $5 or I can go to this for free at the bar. And so most of them, most of whom were straight went there and gay people from Kansas City were there it was a gay and straight uh, celebration. And there was no disdain for one another group. It was just everybody hanging around and, and enjoying themselves. That was my first experience. The first time I saw a change, a shift that occurred. And from that point on, um, on a monthly basis the, at the boys club, which is typically straight, I'm the only gay man there. Um, I'll go there and I'll talk to people and they know I'm gay and it's not a big deal for them. So I think that they've become leaders in that way because they see the equality of everybody. So times are changing. They're different from where we had to be segregated from one another. We can come together as groups. Jerry, oh, our time is wearing very thin. Um, Coco, why don't you go ahead and finish us up? Yes, I'll be brief. Um, remember Deaf Way, the second one? When I went in, the LGBTQ community was there in droves. It was over 500. I don't even remember. It was so much fun and everyone was socializing. We all hung out. I felt so great. After that, I'm like, where, where is everybody now? So it's interesting and, and yes, times have changed. They have changed. Go ahead, Jack, do you have the next question? Yes, yes. Um, let's see, we have three more questions left and um, I'm not sure how we're gonna decide how to answer them, but what advice um, and resources would you share uh, and, and highlight for queer folks who are who are now just getting involved with the community and wanting to learn ASL. What advice would you give those queer uh, people who want to be involved with the community? Can anybody answer that? Coco, please. Coco, great. So I teach at the community college, plus I'm involved in interpreter training and preparation programs. And it's great to be involved with those. Um, and I think it's really important to encourage people to connect with queer deaf individuals and learn how they can 
collaborate and work together and, and show a mutual respect. So we need to respect in each other's spaces as well. And, and when they're becoming interpreters, right? Because they have to socialize. It's, it's a really good idea to work together with these groups rather than try to take advantage of them and just learn from them and then go about your business. Um, it's really important to kind of set up I don't know, you know that we, there's regional signs, there's not signs, signs aren't um, standard all over. And so it's nice to connect hearing students with deaf queer individuals. For example, um, at one of my friends, um, actually a coworker of mine, wanted to get into some, trying to learn some, to be an interpreter. And what they started doing is that they would, and another person that I knew who was deaf wanted to have translation services done. So I made that connection. That's my goal. So that would be one suggestion I have for this individual. Jerry says, that's a great idea to connect and develop and strive. Uh, Jack, next question. Let's see. This person would like to thank you all for sharing your stories. Uh, so powerful and humbling for me to listen and learn as a hearing by pan person. Great, great. So there, it's a two part question. What gives each of you hope for the future and also, what would you like to see us young people grow, continue to grow from the foundation all of you and others before my generation have built? Um, okay, I guess I'll, I'll try to, I'm trying to think of how I want to respond to this. In terms of support, getting that support, kind of advertising and, and developing workshops and presenters and having those experiences shared. I think that would probably be one way that youth can see role models and learn from them. That might be my suggestion. Are there any other ideas, opinions? Richard, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think your question is a very good question. It really is. It's hard too. It's hard to answer. And the reason for that is because based on my own experiences, um, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but just myself, I've seen just a huge difference, uh, generational differences. Their current generation's in a better position than we were in my generation. The struggles that they have today, or actually when the struggles I had back in the day, acceptance and things like that are, are different than they are today. They don't have those same struggles, right? There is acceptance here. It's not a big deal to be gay, to be different. Um, people can walk and hold hands, they can kiss one another um, in this world. So, and like I said, I still struggle with the concept of that, but I think, okay, that's right. That's, they do that. They couldn't do that before. They can now. So it always kind of shocks me a little bit. So it's a very good question. And I find it challenging to answer. I think that's the only way I could say, because it's based on my experience. So um, Don, Don says, remember, um, the Secretary of Transportation in the White House. Billy Ng was, is an openly gay um, married man. You know, people were screaming that they should take him. Nobody is, is saying we, we need to remove that from that position. You know, in our future, nobody's gonna think about it. We are free. We are free. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. 
but we still have struggles. There are still struggles, particularly for deaf individuals, right? Um, go ahead, Richard. Deaf, deaf group. Oh, yep. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Yes, we are free under our current administration. The previous one, not so much. We've had to reverse all the whole system. So today, yes, we're in a better position under our current administration. I'll leave it at that. Very good point. The administration is important. That does have an influencing factor, right? I agree with you, Richard. Don, what did, you, did you want to add something, Don? Nope, nope. Okay, Jack. Okay, our last question. Oh, your stories. Uh, thank you so much for your stories. I am a genderqueer hearing person in my second semester of learning ASL. Nice. One thing that I was struck by is that the signs for pronouns um, are not gendered. There's no she or he or him or her, and that's fascinating to me. For many hearing queer and trans youth, trans people, using correct pronouns is very important. Is this different at all in the deaf, queer, and trans community? Or it, I'm wondering if it's different when you are communicating with hearing people or when you're writing versus when you're just with deaf folks. Do you have to use pronouns or just wondering if, if uh, related to pronouns? So we'll start with Don, go ahead. Don? Oh, okay. So in the deaf community, I mean, the deaf community I grew up in, labels didn't really exist. Black, white, Asian, didn't matter what your ethnicity or race was, people got together. There was not a lot of self-segregation that occurred. Um, hearing people did self-segregate. Um, and, they, and I think pronouns are really important in the hearing community. I don't think it's as important in the deaf community because we don't really like labels. That's my opinion on it. Jerry says, uh, Coco? Yes, Don, that was a great comment, but I'd like to add, um, I where I work, typically, I put under my name, my pronouns, but when I get together in the deaf community, I just tell them, oh, well, it depends on the people, you know, it's not with everyone. I don't tend to say my pronouns uh, until I feel I need to say something that I'll tell them my pro pronouns. I'm a lesbian, androgynous, uh, but really for me, pronouns, you know, it doesn't bother me. What's important is my my lesbianism, that they know that. But pronouns, unless, uh, let's say at work, um, I'll put, I'll add my pronouns. But generally in the deaf community, um, I don't really, that's a great question. I don't really emphasize that. For hearing people and hearing culture, I don't know. Um, again, you know, look at me. I'm very, I have a very strong bicultural um, influence. Deaf community, API community, and that's true. Um, it really depends where, in what situation I'm at. That's a great question. Okay, so Jack, are we good then? We're okay. all good. Good. Well, then I think that's it with the questions. Um, so now, how is everybody feeling right now? 
All good. All good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Exciting, right? Great. This is such a great celebration. Terrific. <coughs> now, so it, it's done. The time has passed. Um, Coco said, wow, that went by really fast. Yes, yes. And um, guess what to do now? I guess we'll just say goodbye. And I, I want to thank each of your panel, uh, each of the panelists for participating in this and helping celebrate the deaf LGBT elders that you are and helping to show the next generation. I'm sure that each of our audience members has enjoyed the show and we hope that uh, Gay Pride is successful. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful, thank you, love you all. Now I'll switch it back to Kavira. Hi again. Hello. Oh, I'm happy to be back here. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to everyone's stories. Each one of you was so unique. Your, your forthcoming about your stories. I hope our audience learned from you as well. Hopefully. I'd like to thank DQRC for coordinating everything. You did, it was an amazing panel. Before I proceed with our closing, hold on to that. I'd like to show upcoming events. I'd like to show, hold, have you hold on just for a second. You see, this event is May 13th. We have a platform every couple of weeks and this one will be May 13th. I'm thrilled to have um, Tom Holcomb come and present about bringing the community together and everyone is welcome. It's a free event, look on Facebook and on YouTube. Our next event is Oops, hold on a minute. 